for coming today and we'll start with our first speaker and our first speaker is Dr. Wei Munchan from editorial, editorial manager at Eli and just to mention that before that uh, Wei Moon did a PhD in pharmacology uh, at Imperial College London and before he also worked at Wiley. So we'll be very excited to hear about innovations at Eli. So just to put your presentation on. Thank you. Can I scroll to the front? So starting from the beginning, um, I'll be talking about eLife's peer review process. So uh, how we're trying to innovate. So in my talk, I'll uh, talk about several key points. So beginning with uh, talking about peer review, uh, why not all peer review is equal. For example, why reviewers can be unresponsive and not very helpful. I'll also talk about the frustrations of peer review and its limitations. Then I'll talk about how eLife is uh, trying to uh, innovate in its peer review, peer review process. I'll then talk about two, two key areas where we're trying to increase transparency of the peer review process. And then I'll uh, end the talk by talking about recognition for reviewers. So peer review and its limitations. So Peer review comes in many different forms. This is a, a flowchart showing the workflow for a traditional peer review process. So highlighted in the red, you'll see that uh, manuscripts often go through review and they can, can also go through re-review. So this process, if you're an author and you're unlucky, can go through several times and several loops. So the different types of peer review also have different degrees of transparency. So in life sciences, for example, single blind peer review is the most common type of peer review. This is where the author does not know the identity of the reviewer, whereas the reviewer knows the identity of the author. Then there's the double blind type of peer review where the author's identity and their uh, relate, uh, kind of related information is not shared with the reviewer and likewise the reviewer's identity is not shared with the author. At the other end of the spectrum there's open peer review. So this is where the reviewers and the author identities are shared between the two parties. So each journal does uh, some often journals will have a way of communicating with their reviewers and um, uh, for example, uh, in terms of open peer review, some well-known proponents of open peer review are BMJ and BMJ Open. Um, with open peer review, you also may have the case where the a journal may publish the uh, peer reviews as well. So for eLife, we have a consultative peer review process. So this peer review process is slightly different and involves uh, the editors and the reviewers coming together and engaging in the discussion before they reach a decision. So if we compare the traditional peer review on the left with the consultative peer review process on the right, both, as you see, will, will, will have the reviewers uh, submitting independent reports. So at eLife, we also have the reviewers submitting independent reports. But then the reviewers will come together and discuss uh, the concerns. And then based on this discussion, the editor will make a decision. So what are the uh, ideal behaviors we want from reviewers? So for reviewers, uh, we want them to provide a well-structured review. So this would uh, for example, involve providing a summary, uh, summarizing the uh, main concerns, also uh, addressing the minor points. Secondly, we'd like them to, for instance, uh, be clear about and specific about their points. Uh, so 
for example, the use of uh, uh, so correcting typos in your review is probably not a good use of time. So, for example, when you're providing a review, if you're re receiving your, re your review, you'd prefer a review which is polite and constructive. So likewise, reviewers should uh, uh, be as polite and constructive as possible. So peer review itself, there are limitations of peer review. So with uh, the number of papers that uh, reviewers are now asking, being asked to review, there's also uh, increased demand on their time, which means that peer reviewers can often take a lot longer than uh, we would want them to. Also, peer reviewers may ask for too much, be critical, overcritical, ask for additional revisions that are way outside the, the what would be necessary for the paper to be accepted. There may also be an element of bias in peer review process. And for, for reviewers, they may also not want to change the status quo. They may be reluctant to change uh, and uh, change their uh, or progress the ideas in the process. So in terms of eLife's peer review process, how does that operate? So this is a flowchart showing our, uh, a, a very sim simplified version of our, uh, how the decisions are made. So when a senior editor and a reviewing editor are in involved in making an uh, initial submission decision, they will determine whether a paper is uh, worthy of uh, further peer review. So if we do commit to peer review of paper, the reviewing editor will often serve as the first reviewer. Uh, the reviewing editor who handles the peer review process will also recruit two or three external reviewers. So once those reports are returned, the reviewing editor and the reviewers and the senior editor will get together to a discussion. So based on that discussion, they will come to a conclusion. Uh, hopefully, they will be able to summarize and present the author with a clear and concise set of instructions uh, for, for example, if we ask them for revisions. So how are we trying to um, uh, innovate? Uh, so in, by increasing transparency in the peer review process. So one of the most interesting parts of the peer review process, process at eLife is the open discussion between reviewers. So after the reviewers have submitted their independent reviews, we will have a consultation session where they can discuss each other's concerns. Within this consultation session, they, their identity group will be revealed so that they're no longer anonymous. This also helps in the sense that uh, their comments will, that they will be more constructive and more helpful, hopefully, through the fact that they're being, uh, they know each other. So, the benefit of this process is that uh, through this uh, kind of refining discussion, they will reach uh, a consensus and agree upon the uh, main concerns they have about the paper. This is as opposed to having two or three separate reviews. And, and then uh, through this process, the editor can make a decision. One other thing is that the senior editor and the reviewing editor will also be on hand to oversee this process so that um, every reviewer has a fair chance to com comment within the discussion. So the second way we're trying to um, increase transparency in the peer review process is through the publishing of decision letters and author responses. 
so for articles which are accepted for publication, we will off, we will, for example, share the senior editors, uh, the reviewing editor, the reviewers, and the number of reviewers, their identity if they agree to share their identity. So the second way we're doing this is, um, as you see, here is an example of a decision letter where the reviewing editor, the senior editor, reviewers all have agreed to share their identity. So this helps with transparency. Here is an example of um, the decision letter with the revisions. So as you can see, the reviewers, reviewing editor and reviewers have consolidated their concerns into four major concerns as, the two, as opposed to two or three separate reviews. The author responses are also published if they're with four accepted papers. In this case, um, so we, we, uh, we took a look at how many, so basically you have this process where before we allowed authors to uh, reviewers to um, opt out of having these published. So 1% we found, 1% of our reviewers opted out, uh, authors opted out of the decision letters from being published. So now we have uh, removed the option for them to kind of opt out and that helps with transparency so that for all uh, published research we have a decision letter and author response. So we did a survey of a thousand reviewers. Um, in general, uh, um, most of the reviewers found the consultation processes valuable and that the openness benefits the process. Uh, a majority of the reviewers also found that the discussion led to a fair decision and also believed that it allowed them to identify, for example, where the paper was asked for revision, the essential revisions that were requested. So here is some of the feedback we've had from reviewers about our peer review process. So as you can see, um, it's positive and uh, a lot of the reviewers enjoyed the uh, kind of collaboration, the brainstorming. Uh, they found the process ran smoothly. They also found that this was a slightly different way of doing things, but they were very satisfied how things worked out. So this is the uh, perhaps the final part of my talk. It's uh, just to cover about the how we're trying to recognise uh, reviewers for their contributions. So working with Toplon, for example. Um, Reviewers can uh, uh, kind of show their kind of review activity at Eli through Toplon, so they can record it and uh, have this uh, showcase. So another way of uh, crediting reviewers is through, for example, through the fact that when we have a paper accepted. Reviewers can also reveal their identity, so that's another way of uh, of uh, recognizing their contribution. We also work with Orchid, and in if you have an Orchid ID, you can also um, cite your kind of uh, eLife re uh, review activity on Orchid. So one other thing I, f I forgot to mention is that. So to date, I think we've had over 750 reviews, eLife reviews, kind of uh, uh, showcased on Publons. So authors have actually, kind of, reviewers have actually kind of noted that on Publons. So actually, that's my final slide. And thanks for listening. Um, do you have any questions?
Hey, thank you for the talk. Um, the consultative review process seems like it's a good idea. I wondered if it added much in terms of extra time because having to go backwards and forwards with the reviewers or whether and the, and the mechanics of how this works, is it a Skype conversation or is it through emails? So the consultation process, if I give you an idea, so once the reviews are returned, the reviewers are invited to our submission system through this online kind of form where uh, it's, it's not like Skype, it's essentially, uh, obviously reviewers will be different in different time zones, so they will have the opportunity to post their, their comments. And then uh, the next uh, uh, participant can participate in that process. So it's not live, you don't have to uh, uh, have a pre-booked time where you're there. But the thing about uh, adding extra time, I, we do appreciate that the, this process is more involved, but one benefit from for this process is that through um, this process, we're trying to agree with the reviewers, so the editors are trying to agree with the reviewers what are the essential revisions and what would they be satisfied with uh, uh, for the potential acceptance of this paper. So by agreeing to uh, the essential revisions, when the paper does come back, the reviewing editor can uh, see whether the author has uh, satisfied those revisions, and if they're happy, they don't have to go back to the reviewers. So there's, uh, there, there's, it's likely that we don't have to go through re-reviews. So that kind of reduces the burden on the reviewers. I'm Marta Rosetera, I'm working as a postdoc in biochemistry department. Yeah. And um, I was wondering, when you mentioned about the reviewers being too critical, uh, in nowadays we know that the reproducibility of the research is very poor. So yeah. I wonder if there is really uh, something like being too critical. Maybe we are not critical enough for in the okay. revisions and actually whether this kind of uh, um, uh, review process that we are discussing, it's going to help this um, reducing the poor reproducibility or increasing the reproducibility of the result. Of the so, uh, in terms of the crit criticalness, what uh, I guess what I'm trying to refer to is less so about the um, so being overly critical in asking for experiments that are way outside the scope of the paper. So, uh, basically, you've got several disparate reviews. Some review asks for this. Our review asks for that, and they're not really focusing on what are essential to the paper. And we, so obviously, we still have to be thorough and ask them for, uh, for instance, uh, to uh, if we're concerned about reproducibility, we'll be ask, asking about those key questions. But we won't be asking for, uh, for instance, um, extensive additional experiments that have are way outside of the original scope of the paper. Hi, uh, I'm Ash, I'm postdoc in genetics department. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, I'm just wondering, from the point of view of the authors, yeah. they're not going to be involved in any of those discussions, yeah. but do you think including the authors at a later stage would be helpful? Would that basically speed up the process and allow the authors to defend their work as well? That's the first question. The second question, yeah. what do you do when, when a reviewer refuses to reveal their identity? Because that, I'm assuming, it means they are not going to be involved in the panel discussion. They're not going to be involved in the, kind of the, in the discussion afterwards. Yeah. Or are they going to be involved but as anonymous? So to answer your second question quickly, so uh, reviewers are not, uh, they, they, they don't have to reveal their identity. So we do prefer if they do reveal their identity, but they can stay anonymous. So they won't be anonymous to the peers in the review process, but they will be to the author if they decide to. So in answer to the first question about, um, that was about of whether adding the author in that process would actually speed up the process. Um, uh, I'm not too sure, but I guess that we do have an example of, um, of another, of, of a type of research where, so we have the research article, but we also have what is called a research advance. So this is essentially um, 
process where someone builds upon uh, a previous work. So previously, it was just limited to the original lab that could do this. But now, uh, a lab outside of the, uh, not associated with or affiliated with the original lab could come and build upon that work. So then in that process, we do involve the original authors. So I don't, I don't know if that kind of answers your question, but in that way, we're trying to ensure that um, they have some kind of like feedback in process. Uh, for instance, uh, if they don't, if, if, they, if they think the, the, they have some kind of negative comments or, or, or some way they, they think it, things could be done better. I'm Sally Thomas and I'm managing editor for uh, an academic society. Um, going back to the question about the length of time that was involved in this extended review yeah. process, how much sort of training do you give your editors and how involved are they? Because quite often yeah. editors are sort of selected and this is additional to obviously they're, they're doing this on a voluntary basis. Yeah. It, as this is a much more involved process, do you, do you train your editors in, in how to deal with this and do they get any recognition? So in terms of the training, we do uh, we do have a kind of onboarding call. We do also have um, they do get guidance from senior editors. So there's always a senior editor uh, guiding them in the beginning, and also staff are supporting them. So in that respect, um, uh, we're trying to ensure that everyone has the same kind of uh, way of doing things. They understand how the peer review process works. How, for instance. Um, so let, let's say one key thing. When we ask for revisions, revisions for example, uh, we ask them, the reviewing editors, to produce a decision letter, but also consolidate the reviews based on the discussion, so as opposed to two or three separate reviews. So that is a very specific part of our process. So review, reviewing editors are, when, they're, when they come on board, we do tell them how this process works. We guide them through the process as well. So did you have a additional question? Obviously, this is a um, process that's based in apparently life sciences. How far can this extend into the humanities? It strikes me as an admirable process in the yeah. humanities review as well. Um, I guess it uh, depends on um, uh, how how the existing peer review systems work and whether it, it should be applicable to uh, other subject areas, other areas as well. So I don't. It isn't applied there at the moment. Pardon? But it doesn't. It isn't applied there at the moment. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I think. So, so with humanities, would it be, uh, is, it, is there more kind of like, um, is there more kind of like, is there more of a barrier for kind of researchers to come together, or would you say, or discussing? Certainly I've only been involved in the graduate student level. Yeah. Uh, publications where it's double blinded you. Yeah. I can see that this process would have been more constructive and helpful. Mm. I guess it should, should some apply. Some I mean, the, the thing is, uh, I guess the concern is some people have a concern of uh, uh, the, the fact that they're not, this is not anonymous. But the thing is, as long as you're uh, discussing things in a constructive and uh, fair manner, then your peers should actually kind of see that as a good uh, behavior. and. Uh, Likewise, responding the same way. Thank you so much for being here. We've tackled yeah. all the questions and 